Over the past few months, the topic of wearables has increasingly made its way into the technology headlines. This class of products represents a range of bands, smartwatches, and glass that typically connect wireless to a smartphone that provides connection to the internet. In September 2013, Nissan, Naimai, Samsung, Qualcomm, and Sony were among the companies that announced new smartwatches. As with any emerging market, the initial set of pioneering products pursues a diverse set of technology approaches. As companies explore the right balance of functionality, cost, form factor, and battery life. This presentation will look into the system approach of some of the initial products and share some of ARM's thoughts as to how this market segment will develop in the future. Our next speaker, Ian Ferguson, is Vice President Segment Marketing at ARM. Previously, he was Director of Server Systems and Ecosystem at ARM, where he led ARM's push into energy efficient data centers. He also served as the Director of Enterprise and Embedded Solutions at ARM, leading a group charged with driving ARM's technology into embedded applications, such as automotive, smart grid, and networking appliances applications. Form, he is also former Vice President Marketing at Enigma Semiconductor, former Vice President Marketing and General Manager at QuickLogic, and also had several marketing positions as European Marketing Manager at IDT and a Technical Marketing Engineer at Motorola, and holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Electronics Engineering from Loughborough University in UK. So please give a warm welcome to Ian Ferguson. Hi. Uh, what it doesn't say out there was I was a terrible hardware engineer. Um, and so like any failed engineer, what do you do? You, you move into marketing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you again for, for being here. I, I, this is my, uh, I think, third presentation to, uh, to Casper. I, th I think the organization is fantastic. Um, these people have a day job, and to see these people working behind the scenes on this other area of uh, activity to drive uh, this society forward and, and pull together the sorts of speakers and this event is absolutely fantastic. Um, now, let me make sure I'm, I'm good with my time as well, because I tend to waffle on. Um, yeah, so like, like the intro said, um, lot of, a lot of things going on in, uh, yeah, a lot of things going on in wearables. Um, and it's been talked about for a while. Um, Mark from AMD talked about his love of Iron Man. Um, I'm more of a Star Trek guy myself, um, and I was the orig original series, 1970s series, so it was uh, William Shatner, and there was two things that were fascinating to me. Firstly, if you remember that series, they would always beam down a security guy that was wearing a red jacket, and you were trying to work out how that security guy was gonna die by some alien. And, and the second bit was about technology, um, right? We, we don't yet have the transporter, but we're certainly getting the medical tricorder. Um, Mark was talking about uh, diabetes from the question earlier, and it's absolutely happening. I mean, we're, we're going to see um, uh, band-aids, I would say from the UK plasters, but band-aids that sit on your uh, skin, that monitor things, have a certain length of uh, life, and, and then will uh, expire. And that, those things of gathering that data out of the skin is absolutely happening. Um, one of the things I think we'll talk about later is, is the challenge of security. Um, a few years ago, um, an infusion pump was actually hacked and proven hacked at uh, uh, one of the security conferences. Uh, and if you look at medical devices that are in the body, um, actually sort of for, for heart, heart, uh, heart monitors and things like that, um, they actually have a wireless interface that comes out of the body because they want to use them to tune that uh, heart to the specific, the, uh, tune the technology to the person's particular um, heart patterns. Well, that's kind of bad to go hack that, right? Um, so we're going to see a number of challenges. Um, you know, Ron talked about security, and I think with these sorts of connected things, that's going to be one of the main fundamental challenges, along with another one that I'll cover later. So we're, we're talking about um, watches, we're talking about um, glass, uh, we're talking about uh, bands, um, whether it's the Nike Fuel Band, the, the Fitbit, that type of thing. 
A um, lot of activity in, the, in those three areas. Um, and and as, as the intro said, a lot of watches that came out in the last uh, six weeks from people like Sony and, and Qualcomm and, and those sorts of guys, even Nissan. I, I kind of, I have to say, I didn't see a watch coming from uh, Nissan. Um, I, I missed that one in my analysis. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. And, and I think very similar to uh, Ron's presentation, we, I think we see you know, different aspects. Uh, you're going to see these end devices, whether they're in your shoe, whether it's on your skin. It's going to be aggregated up into somewhere, um, whether it's a phone or whether it's without a phone. Um, and then you're going to see that data head back up into, into the network. Um, and, and initially, these watches are using typically Bluetooth low energy to connect to the phone. Um, you're going to see other types of connectivity and you're going to see other ways of connecting other than using the phone. And, and when you start to see and try to work out why are some of these watch guys taking different system approaches in the first generation of products, um, there's a few reasons, but one of them is that there is going to be this mix between where the functionality sits. Is all the functionality going to be on the watch or on the band because you don't want to assume there's a se separate device? Or is there going to be more functionality on the watch, uh, sorry, more functionality on the phone and the watch is relatively dumb? Uh, I am a, a believer that at least initially you're going to see relatively dumb devices being connected to your body um, because you're going to want to see battery lives in the um, you know, a week or so before you want to go and recharge it. I don't think you're going to be wanting to charge your watch every single night. I think you're going to need to see that happen every, every week or so. And that's sort of the approach that Pebble have taken with theirs. Other people are putting more functionality into the watch and, and who knows um, how to predict that. One of the earlier gentlemen that just talked uh, used to work with me at IDT. Um, IDT stock went to 102 and I didn't sell. It's six today. So, basic message is I'm not very good at predicting the future. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Quantify itself. And the idea here, if, if you haven't heard this term, is basically bringing in, using electronics, using technology to actually gather data about yourself. Ron talked about uh, um, his wife beating him up on his food habits. Um, you know, we have people. Um, you know, wanting to understand how many steps they've done. Um, and actually, our CTO has quantified the term uh, guilt as a service. And that's when he uses one of these uh, weighing machines where he weighs himself and says, oh, crap, I haven't lost any weight this week. Um, so this data is all being gathered and being pushed up into the cloud. Um, and, and so you're going to see a number of these pieces of sensors coming together with, um, with other pieces. And you know, probably the most recent announcement that happened, really um, after I sent these uh, uh, foils in, you know, one of the other sorts of sensor hubs and sensor fusion points you see now is with the iPhone 5S, where they've actually put in a separate hub that actually t makes sense of a range of information coming into those sensors, aggregates it, makes sense of a combined set of sensor functionality before sending it onto the main processor. So there are different types of types of products. If you if you look at the um, glass products, um, you have actually more space there for batteries and things like that. So you've seen um, typically much more performance. You're seeing um, uh, GP GPU types of technology going into those sort of products. The sort of reality and uh, surrounded uh, experiences that uh, Mark from AMD was talking about earlier. You're seeing pretty high performance processors. Um, you're seeing um, really uh, a, a, an embedded PC in these things. I personally think that this is um, one of those things a bit like glasses for 3D TV. Uh, I think this is gonna find some, um, some homes. Uh, actually, the, the British police force are starting to use, uh, use these things. I'm hearing about applications for firemen that are actually gonna get more information on the house that they're going into if there's smoke to help them navigate themselves around. I think there's some great places to use this technology, I, I'm struggling with how many people are going to actually drive this as mainstream adoption for, for the consumer. But again, remember, IDT 102, 6. So, uh, again, I'm not good at predicting the future. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing that's uh, phenomenal, uh, uh, Ron talked about uh, the VC 
uh, challenge with, with raising money on, on the semiconductor side, and that's absolutely true. What we've seen, though, is just this incredible new way of getting companies and projects started. I, I think the Pebble Watch is just a phenomenal story where, through crowdfunding, they, they raise a lot of money. And, and actually seeing a lot of innovation around these sort of crowdfunding products. I've seen one where you take a phone and you stick it into a cradle and that becomes your, uh, your glass. I've seen all sorts of crazy things. Um, some of these will succeed, some of them will die. Um, but I think this is, a, this is an incredible phenomenon. And I think what you're going to see is the innovation is going to happen slightly elsewhere. Yet, yes, as Ron says, the big semiconductor companies are going to have to innovate on the chip level but you are going to see innovation elsewhere in the value chain where people can cobble stuff together and get much quicker feedback on what's an interesting idea versus what's a terrible idea before they go and raise a whole load of money. Um, not to focus on, on, the, on the ARM technology, that's really not the relevant thing here, but really when you start to look at putting an Internet of Things thing together, um, there are a number of pieces you have to pull together. You have the connectivity piece, you've got to worry about security, um, and there's a lot of software that goes on in terms of authentication, um, making sure that, uh, you know, how is that data going to be managed, um, where is that intelligence going to be placed in the cloud, is it all running down on the microcontroller, is it up on the cloud, and does that change based on the quality of the connection, that type of thing. Um, yeah, we're, we're in some stuff, we've been We've, we've built, built some good products. Uh, Mark talked earlier about uh, energy, uh, and in some cases it's because of us, and in some cases we've, we've just been lucky and landed on some things. Um, you know, what is key is, and, and I think what you're seeing is, is, is really the clever and differentiating stuff is going to be how this sensor information is used. Um, and, and to the earlier point from, uh, uh, I think it was Mark saying that really for technology to be successful, it's got to be there and you don't even use it, right? Uh, or you didn't even, don't even know it's there. Um, as Ron says, his wife's beating him up on his, on his eating habits by, by accessing his data, all of those sorts of challenging things. It's going to be just using, gathering data and, and it's really going to be around the services that is, is, is processed and actually uh, enabled by, by gathering that data. Um, and, and as I mentioned, in the, or as Avery mentioned in the, in the early part of it, lots of people trying different things. Um, again, less about ARM, think microcontrollers below the line and think about main processors that are running Linux kernels and all that good stuff above the line. Very, you know, you're seeing a range of things. You're seeing basic wearables, and by basic I mean the functionality you get when it's shipped to you is pretty much what it is. Um, when you start to see more um, intelligence in the wearables, and that's going to be where you start to see download of new features and functions and services. So you have basic, mid-range, and high end. The high end are the sort of um, the, the Google Glass, uh, the Oakley glasses. There are ski goggles now where you download the ski map of where you are, and you can see where you are on the terrain. Doesn't help you if you're a crap skier, of course, you're still going to fall over. But you at least know where you fell over and how badly it was. Um, and, and in there you see a lot of intelligence, basically an embedded pro, uh, computer. Uh, as you come down into the middle area, which is where the watches are, you're really going to see, um, this is really the, the bit where there's, there's a difference of opinion. You've got, um, it says IM watch there, but also the, uh, the Sony watch, uh, sorry, the Samsung watch is using an A profile core, basically running an a, uh, Android. You're seeing a, most of the other watches below the line. And, and what they're trading off is power and, and performance. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's people trying to test the marketplace. Um, I'm a believer that I, I think you have to get to a week or so uh, of battery life between charges for a watch. But again, we'll, 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 see, we'll see where that plays out. So I guess just to mention on there, where I think this is going is I do think that you're actually going to see multiple processors go into these uh, watches. Because I think over time, you are going to see some applications where they need to run standalone on, uh, on the watch and actually not have a, a, a smartphone accessible. Um, and you're going to see other places where you just want to go into a, a relatively low power mode, sort of slave mode to a, uh, a, a smartphone. So actually what I think will happen in, in ARM technology, and, and of course there's, there's plenty of other ways to solve the problem, is that you'll see on the same piece of silicon a main processor 
uh, an A profile in, in, in our case for Cortex, and you'll see a microcontroller. And depending on the use case, you'll wake up one or the other of them. I, I don't think you're going to see just a pure A profile because that is, is just going to be too power hungry. And I don't think you're going to see just a microcontroller because that won't be able to give you access to the, the mainstream apps. This is a, this is a, um, a place where ARM has uh, an incredible amount of competition. Um, people were very generous about ARM earlier. Um, and we have been lucky uh, to have picked mobile as a, as, a, as a space and work with our partners and, and, and done very well riding that wave. And uh, our focus now is uh, to try and be a company that, uh, like, like Ron said, it's very hard to to stay, uh, stay relevant through these uh, disruptive trends. And so we have to actually worry about a lot of technology that's coming up from below us and what, what can disrupt us, whether that's uh, Tensilla for cores, uh, whether that's Arc cores, whether it's Quartus, Andes, a lot of technology out there. Because in this IoT area, there are less ties to the instruction set than running a mainstream operating system. So it really is going to come down to somewhat what Mark said earlier, a somewhat agnostic approach to the processor core it's going to be what you put around that in terms of sensor technology and user interfaces and services that's really going to get you there. So is there anything new about IoT or is it just cool? Um, you know, we had, um, back in the 90s, way, way before I uh, joined ARM, I was actually one of the first people to uh, enjoy the early wave of PowerPC technology when we were working with Motorola and IBM. Um, you know, back in those days, though, I'm told by ARM that we actually had uh, internet-connected um, heating systems inside our offices in, in Cambridge. And so what was effectively a very long RS-232 cable, uh, we were actually able to connect and control our heating systems in our buildings via a, via a link then. Um, so is there anything new now? Um, and, and we actually believe there is. Um, and it really comes down to the fact that these, this Internet of Things can't be, just like Ron said, it can't just be about connected uh, systems, right? Just because you're connected, eh, don't care, right? Um, there are people that have done a connected uh, toilet, actually, and it's connected via Bluetooth, and uh, there was some stuff a few weeks ago because it just happens to be that the default password for that Bluetooth toilet is 0000, um, and you could drive down the street and flush it. Um, that is not Internet of Things to me. And, and I think if you go back to the original definition, well, it's, there seems to be some debate on what the original one is. There's this guy called Kevin Ashton who was working at Procter Gamble in uh, 1999. He talked about anything talking to anything. And, and I think we're a long way away from that, partly because of the security challenges and partly because there's got to be a standard set of frameworks between companies that are really competing and hating each other today. Um, for Internet of Things to truly hit that vision, you've got to have open standards, you've got to have open frameworks and communication of data, um, and, and we're a long, long way from that. So, but what is different is rather than just a connection, you actually, as Ron said, you're actually going to do something with the data. You have um, car parking spaces in, uh, in San Francisco now that can articulate that they are available. Okay? That, to me, is relatively dull, okay? But what people are doing is actually building new services on that. They're analyzing, yeah, I've got some parking spaces, but they're also saying, you know what, I've got a few parking spaces available, um, or it's, it's, it's currently on a path to not being many left. There's a uh, concert in that area in, in the future. I'm going to up my prices, right? And it's going to start to do some supply and demand on pricing based on that data, okay? So it's not just I'm available or you know, um, flushing a toilet in the earlier part. It's, it's what else you do with the data. And really in ARM, we talk about how big data starts with little data. Okay? Um, so, uh, oh, there was a build here previously. So if you take the orange line, and this is trying to show the value for the application. If you look at the value of smart meters and wellness, uh, we would argue there's actually quite a lot of value to that data. Now, as you go out, there's a, a broader set of applications. You know, I turn my, you know, I want you to turn my lights on just when I arrive home. It's kind of a convenience thing. It's not that particularly interesting in itself. But there are applications like that where there's just a little bit of data 
but you get into some of the earlier comments, right? It's, it's um, you know, if it's a particular thing that's connected, when did you buy it? Who did you tell somebody about it? Did you like it? Did you not like it? How do you use that? Um, who do you use it with? Uh, you build up a pattern out of these small little bits of data that get pushed up into the cloud, and it's the aggregation of that information that's really the vital part to these new services, as opposed to just the connected piece. And as I said earlier, it's, it's really about scale. Um, what we've seen so far on Internet of Things is it's really been one connected thing to one connected service at the top end, right? Um, so one of the things that we like to talk about is a heart rate monitor, okay? So if I've got a heart rate monitor, it, it might be given to me by somebody that's monitoring my heart. That data will just go to my doctor, all right? That's a nicely controlled system. For us to really get to IoT, I want to be in control of where that data goes. Do I give that data to my physician? Probably. Do I, do I mind if I give that data to my uh, um, health, health place? That might be okay. Do I want to give it to my insurance guy if I've been eating bad food for the last six months and not been working out? Probably not, right? So uh, those are the sorts of things we're going to have to start working through in terms of how that information is uh, controlled. I think as a user, as a user, I want to be in control of that data, right? That heart rate is it's my heart. Last time I checked, I want to be in control of that data. And, and at the moment, that data is being pushed up into the cloud. And I think one of the challenges of you know uh, the Internet of Things are going to be consumers that are concerned about where their data goes. Okay. So. The other piece is around standards. So yeah, people are worried about their data, but also we have got to work out how this data is communicated. Um, you've seen people talking about IoT and talking about standards, but actually trying to drive relatively proprietary things inside their world for their own gain. And really for us to actually get to an IoT world where anything can talk to anything, we do have to move to open standards. And you know, the old joke is the great thing about standards is that there's so many of them. Um, and we have to get to a point where we, we align these things up. I don't think we need to have the same physical interface between all the things. There's going to be some places where you use Bluetooth, and there's going to be some times when you use Ethernet, and there's going to be some times when you use Wi-Fi, etc., etc. But the way that we articulate who we are as an individual sensor, um, explain how I want data, what data I have to give, that type of framework of data has to, has to be standardized. And the other piece is that we can't just throw really massive stacks onto these small um, uh, systems. Um, per the earlier discussion, if we've got microcontrollers out in the middle of forests detecting for the potential early sign of a fire, you kind of don't want a guy going around replacing those batteries every time. That, that's probably not a good thing. So these things have got to almost work all the time, and actually having something waking up and saying, now I've got, a, now I've got data, you can't take thousands of bytes to communicate that. It's got to wake up, do its thing, and shut right down again. So we're really looking, again, around framework of standards, how do you get to a point where you are using much more efficient protocols and stacks for machine-to-machine -machine communication, cognizant of the fact that it has to work in an IPv6 world. So, uh, also, we're going to make the last thing an eye chart. Um, you know, I think in summary, there are three big areas for us on wearables. There's the fitness bands, um, there's the glass, and there's the watches. Um, I, I, I think all of us have different opinions on which ones are going to take off, which ones are not. Mario um, could probably come up and tell me how wrong I am in a minute about uh, IDC's predictions. But I think it is hard at the moment, and people are trying different things. I think the more interesting topic is, where is the functionality going to be run? Is it going to be run down on the, on the watch? Is it going to be run on a sensor um, you know, in the band? Or is it going to be up in the cloud? And, and how is that going to change dynamically based on connectivity and what else you have around you? Um, I think it is disruptive. Um, and, and there are new players. Uh, I've seen some next generation watch ideas that are really, really exciting. Uh, and it's a small com you know, it's small companies. They're not innovating at the chip level, they're pulling together pieces of technology, maybe using crowdfunding to get started. 
So innovation is around. I think it's just moved in the value chain a little bit away from semiconductors because, as, as, as Ron said, you need a lot of money to do a new chip, especially down at 16 FinFed, etc. Um, and the device requirements, you know, Mark talked earlier about energy efficiency, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, to get nerdy for one minute, how do you do security, right? Am I going to put really high technology security accelerators on each one of these sensors if those sensors have to sell for 40 cents? Or am I going to say it all runs in software and then my battery life is going to be degraded because it's less efficient? Or am I going to look for somewhere in the middle where I add a few instructions that accelerate crypto, uh, but the majority of it is done in software. Some big challenges there for us in, uh, in, in the IP world to be wrestling with, and indeed we are. Um, so with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll shut up. I hopefully you found that interesting, and I'll uh, open the floor up to questions. Thanks very much. Steve, do you remember those terrible days? Sorry, challenging but fun days. 102 to 6. Yes, Steve knows you there. Any questions? I, I, I can't remember. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so I have a question. So uh, my question is, so do you think, do we really need a 10, you know, 14 nanometer and a 10 nanometer for the wearable? No. So, so I, I think what you're going to see, um, well, that was a very quick answer. So one of the things I think you're going to see is, if you look at sensor technology, the, um, the process node for sensors um, is, is typically further back than the main processor. So I'm actually of a belief that you're going to see more multi-chip modules and, and stacking of technology, because I think you're going to see um, the, the sensor technology have to stay in a relatively unaggressive process node. Um, and the, the main process is, is going to depend on what you have available um, and, and what the requirements are. So I think it is con it's conceivable that you'll see a stack where you could have you know, 90 nanometer ULL for the analog pieces, you might see a different thing for flash, depending on what you need on, based on that. Um, you know, I think we're, as an industry, um, we're, we're working for, through that now. And actually, um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of the, uh, the newer sensor guys um, taking that type of approach. Um, so I don't think, it, especially now as it's emerging, I don't think you're going to see it all integrate down. Um, I think you're going to see that sort of stack because uh, clearly you can't put you know, some of this analog stuff at 16 or 14 or... Hi, hi, Ian. Thanks for the uh, great talk. Here. Oh, <laughs> it's really a bit. The lights are kind of in place. Yeah, um, my name is uh, Yamin Wang. I'm with uh, Wind River Systems. Um, we have seen a lot of OEMs are really uh, moving from just any hardware to a service oriented uh, offering. So they're starting to offer such as HVAC, remote monitoring, water management. The example you mentioned, uh, car parking, street land offers uh, services there as well. Uh, one of the things I'm thinking why all these guys start to offer cloud service, is there going to be a uh, consolidation down the road, especially what you mentioned, that the industry needs to share data. If they don't share data, then Internet of Things won't happen. So I want to ask you, maybe not your best, you mentioned in your forecast that uh, I'm sure you're going to, when you try many times, one time you're going to go right. So uh, I will ask your opinion on this one. The second uh, question is, with your acquisition of uh, Sensing Node, uh, are you actually also moving into offering your cloud service as well? Because they do offer that uh, as part of your, their product. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Thank you for your confidence. I guess uh, we, can, we can meet up in three years and see if this prediction is correct. Um, so, it, I, I think, like some of the earlier discussions, the value is in the data. If you look at why Oracle's excited with um, uh, Internet of Things, it's about getting the data up into their big servers running Java-based apps. If you look at why IBM is interested in it, it's the value of taking all this data from these different traffic lights and street lighting systems, pulling it up and making intelligence in these smart cities. That's where the value is. The outside is going to be commoditized, um, and, and I wouldn't say a race to the bottom, but certainly at the moment there's value in those sensors. But I think over time that will, that will consolidate. 
Um, in terms of our role with SensorNode, I, I think there's two bits to it. Firstly, we think that the software problems are pretty big. Um, SensorNode actually has far more um, experience working with these protocol stacks than ARM did originally, so they actually were very instrumental in the six low pen standard, actually, and worked on the COAP uh, standards too as, as part of the uh, IETF. Um, and, and so I think it's going to be a very similar business model. You'll see um, us providing a software um, to, uh, to what we do in intellectual property in that, um, hey, you could design your own stack if you want to go right ahead. If not, here are some common building blocks. We will stop short of actually selling services up in the cloud and things like that. I mean, we, we wrestle very much between um, we, we can't go too far down the value chain and, and compete with our partners. So I don't think you're going to see us doing Amazon-like EC2 services. But, but providing software building blocks that allow people to establish a TCP IP connection over the internet on their platform, we'll do that as a building block. And, and if people want that, great. If they don't, they can go somewhere else. Hi, uh, I'm George uh, from Verizon Wireless. Uh, I'm working with the Verizon Wireless Innovation Center. So we uh, got hundreds of wearable uh, devices to our innovation center. We do the evaluation. Mm -hmm. The one big problem we found is that the, the power source. Every device needs charge, and uh, it, it uh, lasts. Uh, some last just one day. They, they need to charge every day, and uh, some. The best maybe last a week, but still very painful. I think that this is the kind of um, the bottleneck for wearable devices. So, do you have any vision of how we can solve this uh, power sourcing problem? Thank you. Yeah, no, great question, George. And um, I think um, a couple of things. Firstly, technology is improving. Um, I think we're all wrestling with um, how, we, how we do that. But I think it also is going to come back to where the, where the software runs. And so if you know you're by a, a smartphone, push most of the processing up into the smartphone and, and you'll be good. If you're, if you're standalone, you're going to run, as, run on the main watch. So I think the intelligence is going to be how you partition your applications. And maybe it doesn't even run on the phone. It runs up, up in the cloud and communicates down through a thin stack. So. It's, it's, it's a massive issue. I think it, it, it sorry, um, it, uh, it requires multiple people to look at it. I think there's some technology enhancements, but um, it's going to come back down to where you run that software and how aggressively you shut it down for power saving in periods of inactivity. Yeah, well, unfortunately, our friends in the battery industry just aren't doing us any good favors, are they? Uh, they just aren't innovating it fast enough. So anybody out there, get better at your bloody batteries. Um, in, in all seriousness, um, yes, I mean, I think uh, you, you can sort of see this sort of like uh, disruptive motion. You can see those other things. At least from what I've seen so far of that analysis, it's, it, it helps, but it, it's, it's not going to really um, help you to push the, uh, the battery lives far enough to, to what you say. If you want to get to uh, push it a, a, a step function better than where it is right now, I, I don't think sort of uh, motion stuff is going to be there yet for a while. So I think it's going to have to be more about intelligent use of um, aggressive power down things and actually probably pushing more intelligence. You know, one of the things when um, you have these, uh, these great networks now, um, with, such as yourselves, push more functionality up in the cloud, have very thin communication, efficient communication over your network, and have as little going on in the main processor as you can. And that's one of the reasons why the sensor hubs are not on the main processor, because if you have it out, so if you look at the Apple thing on the M7, as they call it, um, if you have it on there on the microcontroller, everything else is shut down, okay? And, and so over time, yeah, maybe that will come in, but certainly at the moment, Shut down the main processor, have the small microcontroller running with a very thin, efficient stack over the network, and I think that's your best bet. Okay. <coughs> My name is David Wu. Oh, in late 1970s and the 1980s, due to the Star War or uh, fixed generation computing or whatever, there have been a very exciting kinds of uh, innovative computer architecture uh, era. And, uh, 
However, those things are converged by the, by the so-called the, the huge winning, by the wind tail and by arm, by this and by that. So which means uh, the traditional von Neumann type of architecture dominate. Okay. Uh, from my point of view, it's kind of too long to, uh, to impede the further uh, innovation. Okay. For example, like in the 1980s, people were talking about uh, neural area network, uh, even driven stuff. But this, is set, uh, this kind of the so-called sensor area network or the internet of things, from your personal perspective, do you think it's a way to think further to see those all the legacy type of the exciting stuff uh, will become the fundamental problem solver, like the event treatment stuff? Well, on the, on the next panel, we, we've got a gentleman from uh, Intel that sleeps, breathes uh, processor architecture, so I, um, I, I'll, I'll defer a little bit maybe to his panel, but uh, for me, um, I think the intelligence is going to be how you, uh, I, th I think processor cores, you know, we are, you know, you start to talk about threading and, you know, people like uh, MIPS have done that, we've, we've done the multi-core thing, it's going to be about efficient coupling of other functionality outside the processor core to me. Um, and so the heterogeneous thing, whether it's, it's, it's uh, the HSA, whether it's other ways you couple heterogeneous compute, um, you know, Xilinx have been doing some things with FPGA coupled with processors on the same piece of silicon. We'll see accelerators for search and Hadoop and things like that coupled next to the processor. Um, as soon as you go and mess around with the processor core, you start to um, have challenges with your software ecosystem. So I think you have to wrestle between standardization and innovation and where that line is. And I, and I think the processors have pretty much got to stay the same and it's going to be what you put around site, outside it and differentiates it. Hi, uh, Ian. Uh, I'm Cameron Dales. Um, I work for a startup company that is uh, busy trying to scale up a next generation battery. Good. Um, Hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you can come talk to me. Anyway, um, my question to you is if you had a, a 2x better battery, twice as good energy density, what would you actually do with it? Would you shrink the form factors or would you add functionality to it? And basically, how do you think about what's in and out in terms of the uh, various different applications that you could put on your platform. Yeah, good, good question. I mean, did, we didn't even plant him in the audience there. It's like, hey, where's the battery guy? He's like, I'm right here. <laughs> 20 bucks coming your way. Um, I think at the moment, I think the first phase, um, you know, because, um, because everyone's excited about watches, people have been starting to think about functionality. I do actually think it's going to flip. Uh, I, yeah, if you look at the... Um, if you look at the Motorola watch, it, it was really pretty chunky. And actually, the sponsor of um, the watch, um, actually one of the golfers, one of the professional golfers is actually sponsored for the Motorola watch, couldn't actually wear it. So um, <laughs> he actually had a sponsorship deal which actually required him to only wear that watch or nothing at all. So his caddy actually had to go around and wear the watch. And my point is, and I think, it, I think if you look at, and pure speculation, uh, you know, you look at why is Apple brought in a guy from Yves Saint Laurent. I, I think it is, at least on the watch side, it is going to be down to um, uh, uh, fashion, actually. So um, I think at the moment, functionality leads um, size, but I, I think you're going to go down a, down a size path and it's going, to be, it's going to need to look really cool and sexy. I actually think you know, one of the challenges for, for ARM is that you know, we have to make sure, I think there's going to be new players, right? You know, what, what does this, what does uh, a new Nike phone plus watch look like, right? I mean, I, th I think there could be new players coming in that come more from a fashion side as opposed to your traditional smartphone guys. And we know the smartphone guys really well. You look at Jawbone, who started with Bluetooth, they've now focused on the vertical market of medical uh, wearables because they see that as being a niche. We, we need to make sure that we, we see how that value chain um, Adjust. So I think there'll be differences, but but I I would go for keeping you know size size winning right now. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to present this plaque.